Well, good evening. Good to have all of you here. It's Maundy Thursday. Uh, all across the globe, we're launching these holiest of days for the Christian community. Uh, just a little bit of background on the services that you can experience, not only tonight, but over in the, the next couple of days. Uh, for those of you who are in the, the loop, you'll kind of know some of these things, but I just want to kind of be mindful of it for everybody. Uh, Maundy itself is from the Latin term uh, mandate or command. And tonight you'll hear Pastor Joel preach about uh, the command that Jesus had to love one another as Jesus has first loved us after he washed the feet of his disciples. And so that's where Maundy Thursday comes from. We also have a chance tonight to celebrate First Communion, which is also very important because this was the night where Jesus uh, had shared his last supper with his disciples. And so we're going to tie those two images together. Um, just for your information, when we get to that point, I'm going to invite the families, the immediate families of those who are receiving their First Communion to come up. You're going to gather here right in front of us. I will remind you again when we get there. And uh, there's just a couple of things we'll talk about in regard to why it's, we get to celebrate uh, First Communions. And then we'll share First Communion with this group. They will return to their seats and then everybody else will participate after that. Um, at the end of the service, if you've not been at this service, uh, the mood shifts really fast. And so we have this great meal that we've experienced with one another, a great celebration of First Communion. Uh, and then sort of the darkness begins to descend. And so we'll sing a hymn, we'll strip the altar, and in the stripping of the altar, it's sort of the, the kind of the total abandonment and the utter, like, everybody left Jesus' side. Um, Jesus was left with nothing but his own self 
over those next few days. And so that's the symbolism that happens uh, at that time, and it will get very dark uh, in here. What we're going to ask you to do at the end of the service then is to sort of walk out in quiet and make your way to your uh, cars. Tomorrow, there'll be two opportunities for you to come back and hear the next part of the story. Uh, 11 o'clock, there's going to be a service at, for young fa- specifically geared for young families to tell it's a hard story, you know, of Jesus' death. And so uh, we're going to get a chance to kind of do that in community with one another as young families. At 11 o'clock, that will be an Incarnation Hall. 7 o'clock, we're going to be back here. And it's called a Tenebrae service, which means that... Um, There's kind of a descending darkness that happens in that. We'll read seven different lessons from the stories of Jesus' last hours, and uh, with each one we'll extinguish a candle, we'll sing some songs, uh, we'll hear some fantastic music as part of the whole experience. It's gonna be a very moving experience for you, and so come at seven o'clock on Friday night. And then we're busting out Sunday morning. And it's going to be 60 degrees, which we're makes we're sure we're going to be really busting out. Three services, 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. Bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring anyone that you want to experience, that you want them to experience something about the love of this community through the love of Christ. So think about your whole network and make sure that they're here on Sunday with us. So um, that's it for all the different services. Uh, at this point... Yeah, I did enough. Stand as we begin. Join me in these words of confession. God is love, and those who center their lives in love center their lives in God, and God's love dwells deeply in them. May God's love be the center of our... In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, God's love was made visible for us and for all of humanity. The spirit of love leads us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Forgive us, O oh God, for all the ways that we become distracted from centering our lives in you, denying your love for us, demanding our ways at the expense of others, and distancing our lives from those who need us the most. We pause now for a moment of silent confession and reflection. Jesus reveals the heart of God. It's a heart of love that forgives all of our sins and renews our lives for active service. May God's love be the center of our lives. We sing together.
be with you. Let's pray together. O oh God, your love was embodied in Jesus Christ, who broke bread with and poured the wine with the one who would betray him, the one who would deny him, and all those who would abandon him. Help us to remember your Son and the fullness of his love. Unite us to him through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may be nourished to embody your love in this world. Amen. I invite you to be seated. You 
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this night to come to gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to celebrate what it is that you have done for us, for the ways in which you have set us free. Set us free from the bondage of sin. Set us free from the fear of death. Set us free to live in this world, loving others just as you have loved us. And so as we turn to your word now, we invite your spirit to more fully fill our hearts and our minds that everything that is said would be to your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've been with us during this Lenten season, maybe you know that we've been looking at this question of what did you expect? And we've been looking at stories in the Gospels where Jesus comes onto the stage and he does some very unexpected things. Uh, He raises Lazarus from the dead, for one thing, which is pretty unexpected. Um, Have you experienced the unexpected in the past? Uh, This past week on my phone, Google Photos put up, you know, photos from years past. Two years ago on Easter, it was in the 80s, and our kids were on their slip and slide. (laughs) It was a little unexpected as I saw the snow falling to to see that happen. The, The unexpected happens all the time. I remember in elementary school, my dad is a pastor, and so my whole family, my extended family, would come to Indiana to celebrate Easter with us. And we would always race home after church. We'd cross the parking lot. We lived just across the parking lot. And uh, with my cousins, my sister, my brothers, and we would go right in the house to get our Easter baskets right away. And, and one year, my uncle comes out and says, you wouldn't believe it. The Easter bunny was just here. You can maybe see him on the road. Just, oh, no, God just missed him. But I got a piece of his tail. And we're, we're like, yeah, right, Uncle Mark. So we started asking him questions. And, and we're like, okay, Uncle Mark, what, what did his vest look like? And he said, well, it was a purple vest with three brass buttons, but he couldn't button it because his tummy's so big because he's so fat. Like, All right, that seems to fit. What about his tie? What kind of tie was he wearing? And he was like, well, he had this long green tie that was really wide that had yellow polka dots on it. And when he would hop, the tie would fling like this all over the place. And I thought he was going to get caught in the branches, but thankfully he didn't. And then we asked him, all right, what kind of pants was he wearing? And he was like, (laughs) nice try. Everyone knows the Easter Bunny doesn't wear pants. Too much chafing. (laughs) You know that? That seems to fit. My uncle had seen the Easter Bunny. And sure enough, we run inside, and the Easter Bunny had given us all these Easter baskets hidden throughout our house. And there was so much candy and presents for all of us. It it was so unexpected that my uncle had actually seen the Easter Bunny, and we were this close, this close to actually seeing him. Couldn't believe it. The unexpected, right? Jesus does the unexpected, and we see glimpses of that and experience that in our own life, of those unexpected things. Tonight is Monday, Thursday, and it's another night where we get to reflect on some of the unexpected things that Jesus does. Later on, as Pastor Kai shared, we'll be celebrating the Last Supper. Uh, And there's four books in the Bible where we hear that story of Jesus giving those words of institution. Do you know what those four books are? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians. You're right. Yeah. That's unexpected, isn't it? You would think it was John, but no, no, no. John does the unexpected. John tells a different story. And his story isn't even on the same night. Because for John, he wants people to think and to reflect on who Jesus is. Early on in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist declares that Jesus is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. And so, John lines up Jesus' death to take place on Passover, which means they didn't have the Passover meal in John's Gospel, So that, just as people are sacrificing that Passover lamb, Jesus is hanging on the cross, symbolizing Jesus as that ultimate Passover lamb. John wasn't so concerned with being historically accurate. He wanted people to think theologically and more deeply about what Jesus did. And one of the things that Jesus did on that night 
was Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And so we're going to look at that story in John chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, you can open there. We're going to begin in verse 1. Now before the festival of the Passover, remember I said it happens before Passover, very first line. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were part of this world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing the Father, had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that he had tied around himself. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? All right, just pause for a second here. In English, they smooth it out really well because they know people are mostly reading it. They're not acting it out. If they were to act this out and display it more like how the Greek does it, it's, it's like Peter can't even come up with the right words to say. It's, it's a stuttering that he says. He, he, it's more like, Lord... He, he, you might, you, you're going to wash my feet. Like, it's, it's that time when your brain is moving faster than your tongue. You ever have those moments? And it's because Peter is so astonished that Jesus is doing this. It, he can't even fathom where he is at this moment. It, it just is so far beyond anything he ever expected Jesus to do. Now, many of you know this. The washing of the feet was done by the lowest slave, typically one who wasn't even Jewish, probably a Gentile. And if there were no slaves in the household, it'd be done by the person who was lowest on the totem pole in the household, probably a child. If there were no children, then perhaps it would be a woman. So remember, this is a very patriarchal society. This is 2,000 years ago. I'm not advocating that today, right? Keep that in mind. For Jesus to wash his disciples' feet, it was so unexpected that Peter can't even come up with the right words to say to him, to get him to stop doing this very thing. It's, it's, almost, like, it's almost like who, who is it that always has to clean the bathrooms, right? Like it's the one job that nobody wants to do. There's a very simple reason for why Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. It's because none of the other disciples wanted to do it, right? None of the rest of them were willing to humiliate themselves in that way by washing one another's feet. And Jesus, Jesus it says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, displays this action of love to them by completely humiliating himself before them. In fact, it talks about him taking off that outer robe, and, and really it implies that Jesus is, is completely naked there before them, this, this act of vulnerability before them, that, that he performs such a menial task. It's, it's beyond anything they can comprehend. It's nothing that anyone would expect them to do. Jesus does this because of his love for them. The text says that, that Jesus loved them to the end, and it's not just about Jesus loving them until his very last breath, although that's true. It's also about the, the amount and the type of love that he has for them. It it's, conveys this idea of the loyalty that he has for them, this, this sense that they belong to him, and because they belong to him, he wants to display for them every moment of love that he can for them. Later on in chapter 15, Jesus will even go further and say that no one has any, no one knows more love than this than that one would lay down his life for his friends. That Jesus is going to the fullest extent of his love. John 13 sets that up with what we're going to be celebrating and living into tomorrow on Good Friday. The story goes on, and you hear this back and forth between Simon and Jesus. Simon says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. And then Peter says, Lord, you will never wash my feet. 
Don't ever say the word never to Jesus. Okay, that's probably the first lesson. Jesus then responds back to him, unless I wash you, you will have no share with me. Okay, so then Simon Peter says back to him, well, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head as well. And Jesus says to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are entirely clean, though not all of you. For he knew who it was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Now, this is important because this is twice now that John has mentioned that Jesus is going to be betrayed in these short 11 verses, right? And the reason why this keeps coming up, and and later on in John 13, it goes into way more detail, is because John wants his readers to know that even the one who betrayed him, Jesus washed the feet of that Jesus loved him so much that he would humiliate himself for him. And not only that, but Jesus washed the feet of Peter, who completely denied ever knowing him. Jesus washed the feet of all 12 of them, the other 10 who would abandon him when they needed him most. And, And John is saying that this love that Jesus has for his disciples isn't just because they did everything right. Jesus' love for these disciples is because they belonged to him. This story of Jesus washing their feet is that sense of community that Jesus knows will sustain them in the days to come. That there is nothing they could do to make Jesus love them more, and there's nothing they can do to make Jesus love them less. He loved them to the end. And this act of love pushes Jesus to perform this task of washing their feet. It goes on. Of course, Jesus has to explain what he does because they're a little dense. So thankfully, he does this. In verse 12, it says, After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. And then he gives this command in verse 34. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus invites them into a new way of being. He he does this unexpected act of love and says you too can do the unexpected in this world. You too, because you belong to me, can live in this same way. You can have love for one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are one of my disciples. It's a beautiful image of of how it is that we all to live in this world. That love isn't just this emotion that we feel, but it's, it's also those acts of service we can give to one another. And what's more, it's it's not just acts of service that we can give to one another. It's also things that we can give. There's another story in the Gospel of John about the feeding of the 5,000. And what's interesting is that John does something so different from all the other Gospel writers when he writes this story. Because one of the things he does is he, he actually tells you where the bread and fish come from. You notice that? Like... Uh, You can put this up for me, Jack, but in verse 9 in chapter 6, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Right? It's a classic adult kind of explanation. Jesus, you're asking too much of me. There's no possible way we could ever fulfill what you ask of us to do. I imagine that there's this boy that comes up to Andrew and is just like tugging on his robe. Like, here, maybe this will help. I I got some food. My mom packed me a lunch. Will this help? And Andrew was like, thanks, kid, and just kind of rolls his eyes. And Jesus, we got five loaves. This boy has five loaves and two fish. But what is that among so many people? And I got to imagine that this kid knows it's not enough to feed 5,000 people. But there's something in his imagination. There's something in in what he's seen Jesus do that he believes Jesus can take this ordinary loaf of bread and these fish and do something extraordinary with them. 
One of my favorite artists, Joel Skuntanis, made a painting of this very story. And we show this uh, in our first communion milestone because it just captures the imagination of that day, right? You can see the little boy there holding the bread and the fish, and you can see all the bright colors that Joel paints with. He's got a great first name, doesn't he? And one of, one of the most powerful things about the way that, that Joel paints is he loves to do this juxtaposition of children and adults over and over again. So you see the way he paints the kids and the disciples. It's, it's almost like a fifth grader drew it, right? And then you see the seriousness with which he paints the fish and the loaves and Jesus himself, that, that there is this kind of playfulness within it, even though it's this very profound, amazing miracle that Jesus has done. And we show this at our first communion milestone because we know that kids have this amazing ability to trust in God far better than we can as adults. That, that to simply obey is, is to just offer what they have. They don't care if it's enough. They trust in a God who can do extraordinary things through those ordinary gifts. And I think that's how God shows love to us. By taking these ordinary things like bread and wine and doing something extraordinary through them. That through them, Jesus meets us in, with, and under the bread, in, with, and under the cup, and is that real presence that we can take home with us. The thing that nourishes us and allows us to do exactly what Jesus calls us to do. To be his disciples. To show others about Jesus' love through those acts of service and through giving of ourselves. All this for the glory of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. to
So tonight we get to share and participate in two of these marvelous acts of love. Pastor Joel talked about the washing of the feet and that beautiful, humble, sacrificial act of love that Jesus offered to his disciples. And in a moment, we're gonna gather around this particular meal. And it is, we could say, probably the best picture of what an accepting love of God looks like. But let me set it up. So, you remember that what they were gathered around was the Passover. And for those of you who just kind of want to be, put this in a large context, the Passover was the celebration that they did every year after the people of Israel who had been enslaved in Egypt made their way back into the Promised Land. And so they gathered every year to remember that thing. I don't know, have any of you been to a Passover celebration? Yeah, a few of you have. One of the beautiful things that happens at those celebrations is that they, uh, at the end of it, they say, next year in Jerusalem. Right? They've been waiting, waiting, waiting for God to act in a real defining way. And so they gather around this meal that they have, and each part of the meal has a different symbolism of it. It reminds them of the story because we're all part of a big story. And Jesus was sharing that particular story with his disciples that night. And what he did was he took a couple of the elements and he just redefined them a little bit for us as we would now gather in this particular community 2,000 years later. So he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the Passover meal, what was the Passover bread? It was the bread to remind them that they had to get out of town quickly because it was unleavened, right? But he's saying, no, I'm gonna somehow be mysteriously and uniquely and lovingly present as you gather around this meal for centuries, for centuries. And they gathered around the wine and there were cups of wine that were gathered around the table as they were meeting. And actually there was one of the cups of wine was for Elijah and Elijah is a prophet that they believed was gonna come back. And so that cup of wine just stays there because again, there's this desperate sense of hopefulness. Jesus picks up the cup and he says, this cup is the new covenant and covenant means a new relationship in my blood. It's given and shed for you, and listen to this, for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you eat and drink of this in remembrance of me. As we gather around this particular meal tonight, what we're doing is gathering around what God has been doing in the lives and the hearts and the minds of people for centuries. And we're marking it as a chance to say uniquely as we gather around this bread and wine, and we're not exactly sure how it happens, but we believe and we trust that when we receive it with one another, we are actually participating in the life of God. We are receiving Jesus into us and through us so that we can be Jesus' people into this world. That's the gift of this meal tonight. As we gather around this meal, we also remind of, are mindful of the prayer that he taught us, and so let's pray those words with one another. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So here are the instructions for all of you, and then I'll give the instructions for those who are receiving First Communion. For all of you, once the families have come and received their First Communion and have made their way back to their seats, you'll be ushered down the aisles. You'll receive the bread in your hand. We invite you then to take the bread and dip it into the cup, and the cup is the red juice, is, or the red liquid is uh, wine, the lighter liquid is grape juice. Receive the elements together and then return to your seats by means of the side aisles. There's an offering plate as you can make your way down because again, we believe that Jesus continues to be generous in pouring out love to us in this community. And so one of the ways that we respond back in love is by giving generously back to God. So you can place those gifts in the plates. Uh, now, we get a chance to celebrate with some kids who are receiving their first communion. So I'm gonna ask them and their parents and if they've got brothers and sisters, right? Close family unit, if you could make your way down here, and Miss Rebecca is gonna join me. We're gonna serve you communion in just a moment. But you're gonna come here and gather right in front of me, and we'll put the kids right in front of their families. Is that all right? Got it? We can figure that out? Kids who are receiving first communion, right in front. Perfect. 
perfect. Look at all this. This is fantastic. Good. Stretch them out over here. Come on over. Make sure. One, big community. This is a great night of celebration because we've created a space for these families to know and to love their God in this very specific way. And so thank you, big community, for wanting our families of this community to know and to love God as they gather around this particular meal. Second, parents. Um, when your kids were baptized, you made promises. And we know it's not easy to keep promises in the world that we live in. And so we are saying to you tonight, we're so grateful that you've kept this part of your promise. Because you, get, you promised that you would bring your kids to this house of worship. You promised that you would give them a chance to experience the life of God through Sunday school and through worship and all the ways that we do that. And you've also said, we're going to get them to the table sometime. And you did it. And so we're so grateful that you fulfilled your promise and we ask you to continue to uh, just be encouraged by that because it's not easy in this world to take that on. So we're grateful for that. Kids, welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. It's awesome, isn't it? Now, I know many of you are going to miss having a pastor or someone else put their hand on your head, aren't you? Right? And offer you the blessing? Probably not. But today, you get to be a part of this big story. And you like stories, right? Right? And so the story started a long time ago, as we were just saying, and the story gets lived out today through you. And one of the things I want you to hear very clearly, every time that you come up, you're going to hear these words, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. What that means pretty simply to mean is this, Jesus loves you and wants, you to, be, wants to be with you. That's it. Jesus loves you and wants to be with you. Jesus loves you and wants to be with you. Jesus loves you and wants to be with you. So literally, every time you come forward, and if you hear those words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, I just want you to take that and say, you know what? Jesus loves me and wants to be with me. And when you get to be with Jesus, it's pretty awesome. So, community, I want you to celebrate with this, these families and these kids as they make So, Ms. Rebecca and I are going to make our way down this row as the music is playing. You'll get to sing along a little bit with Let Us Break Bread Together, and there'll be other music playing during communion. We'll serve all of them first. As soon as you've received communion, you can make your way back to your uh, places, and then the ushers, the community assistants will come down, and the ushers will move forward with the rest of you. But first, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you, parents, for being part of this community. Thank 
So after the meal, as they were singing the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though all become deserters, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. Then they went out to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. We we'll sing two verses of Go to Dark Gethsemane.